she's in her, you know, college, in her finals before going to college. And then this is the reason that the thing turned, that, that affected me. Here she was doing absolutely no work because nothing in her educational career had grabbed her interest passionately. She had always wanted to be in the biological field, but they never let her in the schools because in order for her to be a science major, she had to do well on all the other subjects that had nothing to do with what she was interested in, so she didn't do any of them. The minute she got out of their grasp, she zeroed in, and she was one of the few people back in the 60s, the few women back in the 60s, who got a PhD in a hard science in biochemistry from Columbia University, and she got it because she was passionate about it and learned it. And she didn't learn all the other stuff that all of us had to learn that none of us remember. And I, I, I usually, when I talk to audiences in general, the first question I usually ask people, and I tell engineers, and I think there are a lot of engineers here, so it's sort of not the right place to ask it, but I always ask people, how many of you in the audience know how to solve a quadratic equation? Right now, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. What's the formula for solving a quadratic equation? And in a normal audience, not heavily weighted with engineers, you know, maybe one or two people will raise their hands. And suddenly you begin thinking, what are all the other myriad things that I was taught in school and tested on and told were important and essential for my life that I have never, ever used? So I'll, instead of starting my words with that, I'll end it with that. That's pretty much the, the, the theme of turning learning upside down. Uh, you know, we've turned it upside down in our schools. The idea now is to turn it right side up. That's what the book's about. I just have a, for, I'm not going to talk for the hour they invited me to. <laughs> I just want to say before making my remarks that in this authorship, the sequence of the type of the authors is wrong. He was really the senior author. It has nothing to do with age, but I'd like to set the record straight. About uh, four or five years ago, Hara Sokolov, who's a professor of education at Penn, uh, has an annual meeting of superintendents of schools from all over the country, but mostly from the East, and he asked me to speak to them, which I did. As a result of that, the superintendent of schools in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, asked me to come over and talk to his board of education and a group of parents who are active in the Parent Teachers Association and a selection of students. So it was a nice audience, it was a big one, and had all the stakeholders in the school system there. I spoke about the kind of changes that we talk about in the book, and at the end of it we had discussion, and the first parent got up and said, I really don't know why you're here. He said, we have one of the best school systems in the United States. 95% of our kids get to the college. They perform in top grades. Uh, we're very satisfied with the system. We don't know why you want us to change. Well, two or three parents got up after that and said essentially the same thing. And then a young lady, who was about 30, who was sitting on the side stood up and she said, I am the director of counseling for the school system. She said, I wonder if the parents who just spoke were aware that we had 13 suicides last year. And the place became dead silent. The conversation ended at that point. Now, the reason I tell you that story is I was invited there by the superintendent of schools, a fellow by the name of Mark Sherman. His daughter tried to commit suicide last week. I talk about irony. I met the same group uh, early this week, it was on uh, Tuesday, and it was a very large group of superintendents, almost 100 people. And the difference between that meeting and the one four or five years ago was huge, and Dan and I have been discussing it. Because this group, the questions were all about how do I do it, not why it can't be done. And the transformation in four or five years was just huge. One question I was asked, I just reveled in, was, look, I can't change the whole system overnight. Where can I start and do something worthwhile? 
Well, fortunately, the answer to that is easy because that's what happened at the charter schools. They started with one school, and when it got going, it seemed to be reasonably successful and multiplied them. So I suggested what he do is study Sudbury Valley and then try to set up one school following that model as closely as he could, and success will take care of the rest. And if it doesn't succeed, then it shouldn't take care of the rest. So it's fairly easy uh, to get started. If they only have the one property that the current system of education leaves out, and that's guts. Because the one thing it requires to innovate something that's radically different is courage. And we never talk about courage in school. All we talk about is learning, intelligence, knowledge. But the difference between a leader and somebody who's a, maybe an educated follower is he has the courage to take a chance and put his neck on the line. And that's what Dan has done. He did it way back in 1968 when he started Sudbury School. I wish you could visit it. It's absolutely a revelation to see these kids running around, managing their own lives as efficiently as they do. I just want to tell you one story I got from him. There was a young lady who was caught stealing from somebody in the locker room. Was she about 11 years old, was she? And they caught her. It was no question she was guilty. So she appeared before the court, which were all students. And the students met it out of punishment. It was a little bit like community service. But that's not the point. They put her on the court. Now just think of that. What a marvelous solution that was. You know, she never was a problem from there on. But imagine putting the criminal on the court to judge other crimes. It's just absolutely incredible. The other thing, the Japanese made a film, a wonderful film at Sudbury School, and it, it has subtitles in English. And there's one scene in there that my wife and I will never forget. Mama brings a four-year-old girl to the school, takes her into the main building and drops her off, and just leaves her and goes out. Nobody takes a hold of the child and takes her around to show her what to do. She starts wandering around with a little knapsack on her back, and she wanders around out of the building into the shed on the side till she finds some people doing something she's interested in and she sits down and starts. And that was her introduction to the school. It was completely self-controlled. And that, that's really the essence of it. It's control of education by the person being educated rather than by people who think they know how others ought to be educated. And that's only because they're stupid themselves. Okay, let's take some questions and issues that you like to talk about. You want to prepare any questions? Don't be shy. I have one that's, um, I, you know, I have a learning disabled brother, and I was just wondering, is your theory and your approach um, applicable to like special ed and people with learning disabilities? I mean, do you see? The reason I, I raised that is because he was not a great reader. He was educated to read to a sixth grade level, so he did function. But where he became keenly interested in certain topics, like baseball or any, any you know activity that he felt was um, something he wanted to know about, he just you know he didn't know that he had a learning disability. So is there the whole methodology and the whole approach? Is it applicable to learning disabled yeah. students? And so forth? Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I, have to, I have to stand here. I, I don't want to talk about your brother because I'm, I don't know him. Okay? But I can tell you something about learning disabilities from experience. The overwhelming majority of things that are, quote, diagnosed today as learning disabilities are not real, inherent physiological disabilities. They're sy system caused disabilities. And I'll give you just a couple. And, and I followed this over 40 years. You know, it's a miracle. When I went to school, it's really unbelievable. Somehow, almost nobody in the population when I went to school back in the 40s had a disability. It's just unbelievable. I mean, you know, we must have been a different race. Today, over 20% of the children have disabilities. Now, here's the thing that you have to understand. And if you're, well, if you're on the inside the way we are and know what the educational community is doing, maybe there are some teachers here who will understand this. The way learning disabilities are identified, it starts in the classroom. And 